ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet, brought to you by Chesterfield. This is the best, Chesterfield, and the time to change today. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. A man walks into a pawn shop and wants to sell a ring. Indications are that the ring is stolen. Your job? Find out. This is the best. Chesterfield. And the time to change today. In choosing your cigarette, be sure to remember this. You will like Chesterfield best because only Chesterfield has the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine, best for you. All of us smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. Get a carton of Chesterfields today. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. Both at the same price in most places. In regular or king size, you can get them either way. The best smoke ever made's the Chesterfield you buy today. Smokers coast to coast are changing, it's a cinch to do. Here's all you have to say to get the one that's best for you. Chesterfield's for me, Chesterfield's for me. You just say it's Chesterfield's for me. This is the best, Chesterfield. And the time to change today. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name is Friday. We were assisting another team in checking out pawn shops, and it was 9.27 a.m. when we got to 552 South Main Street. Pacific Loan Company. Hi, Joe. Frank. Herb, Hi, how you Herbie. doing? What is it? Business or pleasure? A little of both. I'd like to check the Bible. Can, Herb? Sure thing. I'll get it for you. Where's your partner? Took the day off. Going to get some sunshine. You picked a good day for it. Yeah. Here you are, Joe. Thank you. Herbert, are these all the tickets for yesterday? Yeah, it was kind of slow Monday. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything? No, not what we want. Okay, thanks, Herb. Oh, it's okay. You know, Joe, anytime we can help you, fellas. Yeah. Say, Joe, while we're here, I'd like to look at a guitar. What? Not for me. You know me better than that. The only piece I know is it ain't gonna rain no more. What's wrong with how dry I am? It's funny. Mm. What do you got in a good guitar, Herb? Well, come on down here. I'll show you some good buys. One of my neighbors asked me to check if I had a chance. He wants to buy his kid one. Mm -hmm. What do you got? Do you see how much you want to spend? No, but I don't guess he wants to lay out too much. How about that one hanging up there, the one with the knobs on it? Oh, that's an electric. What's with the knobs? For volume. Oh. How much? You know, that one, I'll let you have it for $30. I don't think you'll go that much. You got something cheaper? The kid can make his own volume. That's nice looking, though, don't you think, Joe? Yeah. Hey, here's a good one, a Spanish. Is that the regular kind? That's right. How much is it? $12. Oh, well, that sounds more like his speed. Can I see it? Sure thing. Yeah. It isn't tuned, but go ahead and strum it. Uh-huh. But what should I be listening for? Tone. Oh. Yeah, that's nice. Oh, excuse me, fellas. Sure, go ahead, Herb. Something I can help you with, sir? Yeah, maybe I got something. How's it sound to you, uh, Joe? Right, you want to step to the back? I don't know. I'm with you. What are we listening for here? Uh, what is it you Tone. Have you know. Oh, yeah. Well, right. <laughs> this neighbor told me he's pretty lucky. How's that? Well, his kid's been watching those singing cowboys on TV, so now he wants to be one with a guitar. Mm-hmm. This guy next door says he's glad his kid hasn't got all wrapped up in space shows. Well. Says he couldn't afford a spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> I don't guess there are too many second-hand spaceships for sale, are there? Joe, I think he's trying to push your hot ring. I turn it down. Let's go. All right. Hey, you, fella, hold it up. 
You mean me? That's right. Police officers. What's the matter? Let's go over to the doorway. Right over here. Well, why? Come on, move. All right, hands over your head. Come on. Turn around. All right. He's clean. See your identification. Like what? You got a driver's license? Yeah. Get it out. All right. Here. Take it out of the wallet. Sure. All right, give it to me. James Fetter. This your true name? Yeah. You live at this address, 1201 South Grattan Street? Yeah. All right, here you are. What were you doing in that shop? I went in to sell a ring. Let's see it. All right. Here. The ring belonged to you? Yeah. I want to wait here, Frank. I'll check Herb. All right. Herb, you want to come out here a minute? Sure. All right, take a look here. Is that the man who tried to sell you the ring down there? Yep. Yeah. All right, now look at this. Is this the ring? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an emerald. Real good stone. Why'd you turn it down? Well, I thought there was something wrong, like I said. Yeah. Well, he wanted to sell it for $20. Yeah. The ring's worth close to 1000 We took James Fetter to the office for questioning. Frank checked with R&I and found that he had a previous record. He'd been picked up on suspicion of burglary and had served one term for auto theft. The ring was examined and found to be genuine. Fetter maintained the ring belonged to him. After an hour of interrogation, he began to change his story. All right, I didn't know what it was worth. You mean the ring wasn't yours, then? Yeah, if I'd known it was worth that much, I wouldn't have tried to sell it so cheap. Well, where'd you get it? I found it. Where? MacArthur Park. When? Last night. I go over there all the time in the evening. Did you do anything about trying to find out who lost the ring? Yeah, I checked in the papers and the lost and found. I guess I looked in all of them. I didn't see any ads, though, for a green ring. Uh-huh. Well, I looked at the ring real close and didn't seem like a good stone, so I decided maybe it wasn't worth anything advertising. No, but it was worth trying to sell, wasn't it? Well, like I said, I ain't working. A few bucks would come in handy. Yeah, sure. You don't believe me, do you? Well, you haven't given us much reason, have you? You started out lying. Why should we think different now? Yeah, I guess I told you it was mine. I was afraid maybe you'd think I stole it. But I told you the truth now. You have. Huh? I can prove it. You take me out there. You take me to that park right now. What'll that prove? Well, I'll show you just where I picked it up. Well, now, if we wait until Sunday, the trip won't be wasted, will it? Huh? We can listen to the band concert, too. We continued to question James Fetter, but we were unable to change his story. He was booked in on suspicion of violation of Section 459 PC and held for investigation. We made a check of his residence, his friends, and the places he was known to frequent. We could find nothing to hold him on. He came up on the overtime sheet, and he was released. The ring was booked as found property. Friday, June 20th. Morning, Joe. All right. You check the book? Yeah, nothing in. Mm hmm. Joe? Letter for you. Thank you. Right. Listen to this. Hmm? You did me a favor, now I'm going to do you one. Go to the Greyhound Bus Depot, rental locker number 103. Yeah, is that all? Take a look at it. Here. Huh. Typewritten, no greeting, no signature. Yeah. What do you think? Let's check it out. Frank and I took the letter over to Leighton Prince, and then we drove over to 6th of Los Angeles Street, the Greyhound Bus Depot. We went to the office of Ralph Thomas, the regional manager. We told him about the letter, and in his company, we went to check on locker number 103. Well, the locker's empty now. We'll have to see if anything's been removed from it recently. You want to come with me, gentlemen? We'll take the elevator to the basement. All right, fine. Thank, Thank you very you. much, sir. How are the lockers checked, Mr. Thomas? The 10 cents pays for 24 hours. All lockers are checked at midnight. I see. When the time limit's up, the articles are removed and a new lock's put on the locker. I see. Of course, as long as the fee's paid, we don't bother it. Mm Mm-hmm. All the things removed are ticketed and held for 90 days. I see. See, we hold them here at the depot for 30 days and then remove them to a warehouse. (laughs) You'd be surprised at how fast they accumulate. Yes, sir. Here we are. Hmm. You mean all these things here have been left in lockers? <laughs> People checked them, didn't come back for them? That's right. We get quite a variety of things. Yeah, you sure do. Of course, not all of them are of much value. For instance, sometimes a person will go out, buy a new shirt, change it in the station, check the old one, and forget about it. Mm-hmm. Look at that, Joe. See that stuffed yellow poodle dog mm-hmm. up there? Yeah. Over there, half a radio. <laughs> That's not much good unless you know the guy with the other half. Huh? Flat iron. Sure, a lot of stuff. Yeah, what about locker 103? Well, let's see now. If there was anything taken from it, it should be right over here. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, there's some nice-looking luggage. Don't see how a guy would forget something like that. Here we are. Feet. Feels like a small box. 
That's from number 103? Uh, that's what the ticket says, see? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What about the date that this was removed? Well, let's see. Midnight, June 17th. That was three days ago. Yeah. Don't care if we open it? Not at all. Here you are. Here, give me the paper, Captain. Yeah. Looks like a Christmas card box, huh? Yeah. Take a look, Frank. Uh-huh. What's in it, Sergeant Friday? Jewelry. We signed a release form for the jewelry, and then we went back to the office. A check of pawn shop records was made, and we found that all the pieces had been reported stolen in a recent burglary. Leighton Prince had called to say no prints were found. The owner, Mrs. Carlton Hendricks, was notified, and she came down to the office. 11.07 a.m. Are you Mr. Friday, the gentleman that I talked to on the phone? Yes, ma'am. It's my partner, Frank Smith. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Smith? How do you do? Smith. Oh, that's a nice, uncomplicated name. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Smith, I think you look like a very competent officer. Thank you, ma'am. And you, Mr. Friday, you look, well, as though you might be more complicated, but very efficient. Very nice of you, thank you. You see, that's one of my hobbies, reading character from faces. My friends say that I'm most always right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, when you called, I was so thrilled. You can understand what it means to recover possessions that you'd given up for lost. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to check the pieces now? Yes, you know, I had to call off a bridge party this afternoon, but then there'll be others, and this will be such an experience to tell them about. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you'll just look at these pieces and tell us if they're yours. Oh, all right, Mr. Riley, whenever you're ready. Yes, ma'am. Well, this is the box they were found in here. Well, it's a Christmas card box. How clever of them. I must remember that. You know, tell my friends. Yes, ma'am, you do that. Frank, would you hand me that newspaper, please? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just spread these on the table here, and you can see them better. Maurice would just die if he saw this. Is that your husband? Oh, gracious, no. I don't have one. I mean, at present. I'm divorced, you see, but we're still very good friends. I met Maurice, the jeweler. Huh? Just the way Mr. Friday spread my jewels on the newspaper. You see, when Maurice showed me these things, he had them all displayed on a wonderful piece of velvet. Oh. Then you recognize these pieces as being yours, Miss Hendricks? Oh, them? yes. Well, there's my wedding ring and my gold charm bracelet. Have you looked at that close, gentlemen? No, no, I missed it. Oh, you should. Here, here, now, look. Now, you see, all those things have a special meaning. My husband gave them to me. Uh, the little stop-and-go light. Oh, that was silly. I was just learning to drive. Yeah. It was a good thing we had insurance. Oh, and this little wheelbarrow. The first time we went to the races, and I won so much money, he said I'd need this to carry it in. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, then I guess we can report that the jewels have been identified by the owner, huh? Oh, uh-huh. You see this little cell phone, Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am. It's got a number on it. But my husband didn't give me this. He didn't? Oh, no, no. It was all innocent enough, but poor Carlton. That was my husband got furious. I even caught him with a magnifying glass one day trying to read the number of the dear jealous man. Uh-huh. Is everything out of the box, Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am. It's all right there in the paper. Why? Well, I don't see my ring. You mean this one right here? No, 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 no. That's not it. Uh, it was an emerald in platinum setting. Well, when we checked the burglary report, I don't remember seeing any listing for that, Miss Hendricks. Well, yes, I know. At the time I made the report, I hadn't missed it. These things were stolen from my jewelry box. I thought the emerald was in the safety deposit box. I see. But why didn't you make a report when you discovered that it was gone? Oh, well, it happened at a bad time. I'd made plans to go over to Reno for a vacation. You know what a lovely place that is. Well, I thought if the rest of the things were recovered, the ring would be too. Well, nevertheless, you should have taken the time to report it, ma'am. Oh, yes, I know. But at the time, I was more concerned with my plans for this trip. Have you ever been to Reno? No, oh, ma'am. Oh, you should go sometime. It's really wonderful. I'm going back this winter for the winter sports. Do you gentlemen ski? No, ma'am. No. Miss Hendricks, how much was your ring valued for? Well, I'm not quite sure, but I think Carlton paid something like $1,000 for it. Mm-hmm. Well, three days ago, we recovered an emerald ring that was supposed to have been found. It may possibly be yours. There, you see. Nothing to worry about. I just knew when I saw you two men that everything was going to be all right. My friends are right. I can't read character. Yes, ma'am. We'll have to go over to the property department to identify the ring, Miss Henry. Oh, good. Good. That'll be another experience. I'm going to have to get in touch with Carlton. I'll need another charm for my bracelet. Yes, ma'am. You will. And I know now just what I want. Something that symbolizes this occasion. And especially you two officers. Uh-huh. And you guess what it'll be? No, I can't. Can you, Frank? No, Joe, I can't. Two little gold bloodhounds. We took Miss Hendricks over to the property department in the central jail. We signed out for the ring, and she identified it as being hers. All the jewelry was booked as evidence. 
We went to the district attorney's office and got a warrant for the arrest of James Fetter. We got out a local and an APB on the suspect. Frank and I checked his residence, but we were told the suspect had moved several days previously. The landlady had no forwarding address. She couldn't tell us about any visitors or any mail he'd received. She was unable to tell us if he drove a car. We rechecked his known associates and friends. Several leads were obtained, but none of them turned up anything. Five days went by. Thursday, June 25th. Morning, Frank. Hi, John. You been here long? About five minutes. I just couldn't hit the lights this morning. What's new? Well, we got a call from auto theft. Yeah. They picked up a man early this morning trying to steal a car. Somebody we want? I think so. James Fetter. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. All of us smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. You smoke with the greatest possible pleasure when your cigarette is Chesterfield. Only Chesterfield gives you the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine. Best for you. Get a carton of Chesterfields. Chesterfield regular. Chesterfield king size. Both at the same price in most places. It's America's most popular two-way cigarette. This is the best. Chesterfield, and the time to change today. Before Frank and I checked out of the office, we contacted all of theft detail and told them we wanted to talk to Fetter. We drove over to the main jail. The suspect was brought to the interview room. I heard you guys were looking for him. That's right. I could have come in, but I didn't think it was important. So you do it the hard way, huh? This is a bad beef. I guess you figure them all that way, huh? No, not always. You take a chance. You get caught, it's bad. But you ain't getting credit for something you didn't do. That's so? Yeah. What do you want to see me about? You don't know, huh? No, just as some of the boys said you were asking for me. Thought maybe you'd like to tell us more about where you found that ring. Oh, that again? Yeah, that again. You got my story. Now, what more do you want? We got an alibi. Now we'd like the truth. I found it. Sure you did. I don't know where I fit in and what you're trying to build, but I want no part of it. It's not that simple. All right, you tell me. That ring wasn't lost. It was stolen, and you know it. You figure I'm your pigeon, is that it? Let's try it for size, huh? Mm -mm, not this time. You can leave it with somebody else. Might take a little time, but we're going to make you on it. No, not from where I sit. You'll need a better story than you got right now. Well, not until you can prove I didn't find it. We got the other stuff you took. Oh, come on. Now you're really reaching. No, I don't think so. You did us a favor, but that doesn't put us on your side. Look, maybe you better fill me in. We got your letter. You did? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Now tell me what I said. I'll do even better here. You read it. This is the letter I wrote, huh? That's right. Uh -huh. I get it. Now, you found some stuff down at the Greyhound Depot. You called it. Well, I'll give you something else. Yeah. I didn't write that letter. I don't know who did, but it wasn't me. The ring you had has been identified by the owner. A lot of other stuff we recovered. Look, I'll tell you something. It's like I said. You take your chances, but I ain't going to front for this deal. Yeah. Looks like someone was trying to nail me in, but I don't want it. You said I did your favor. I didn't, but I'm going to now. All right. Why don't you? I got that ring from a girl I know. What's her name? Jill Mason. Go ahead. Well, I ran into her the other night. I told her I could use a couple of bucks. She's owed me 15 for a long time. She said she didn't have any cash, but she gave me the ring. Uh -huh. I didn't know what it was worth. That's the truth. I don't think she did either. She's carrying a pretty fair package at the time. Well, go ahead. Well, she told me she got the ring from a boyfriend. That's all I knew about it. Why'd you give us the story about the park? Well, I figured maybe it'd keep her out of trouble. As long as you had the ring, I thought that was enough. Well, what's this girl mean to you? You mean how well do I know her? Yeah. I talked to her, that's all, but the only reason I give this to you is I don't want to pay somebody else's bill. She ever done any big time? I don't know. I never had any serious talks with her. Want to tell us where she lives? Yeah. You know, I don't understand that letter. Maybe you still think I wrote it, but I didn't. We only got your word for that. No. Doesn't make sense I'd send a letter if I'd taken the stuff and wanted to keep it. You might have. Why? You made a lot of other mistakes. After further questioning, the suspect gave us a description of Jill Mason and her address. Frank and I went back to the office and checked her name through R&I, but we found no previous record for anybody answering her description. We drove over to 943 Wright Street, and we found the apartment house Fetter had told us about. Jill Mason's name was listed on a mailbox near the front entrance. We went up to the third floor, apartment 316. We rang the bell, and the door was opened by a woman of about 35 years of age. Her face showed signs of having recently been bruised. Yeah? What is it? You Jill Mason? That's right. Police officers would like to talk to you. Oh, well, I was just going to the beauty part. I am late now. We'd appreciate it if you can wait, ma'am. All right. Art, if we come in? Guess so. Thank you. <clears throat> Live alone here? Yep. Art, if we look around? Go ahead. Frank? Yeah. Look, 
What's this all about? I don't think I like it. That slob Whitey put you up to this? Beg your pardon? Whitey, the bartender up the one stop. That chisel make a fuss over the couple of ten-cent glasses I broke last night? We haven't talked to him. It's okay, Joe. Wouldn't have surprised me if he had. Imagine him telling me I wasn't no lady. His shins are going to be sore for a couple of days. Do you know a person named James Fetter? What's the last name? Fetter. F-E-D-E-R. You say he knew me? Can you tell us that, please? You know him? Yeah. Say, uh, this going to take long? To make a difference? Yeah, I'd like to call and cancel my appointment. All right. Thanks. Hi, Helen. Joe Mason. Going to have to cancel my appointment. Okay, I'll call you. Yeah. I'm sorry, honey. Yeah. Well, goodbye. No sense keeping her waiting. I didn't have to ask you if you'd be here long. When it wasn't about last night, I knew. Mm-hmm. You mind if I sit down? Go ahead. I could lie to you, but if you've talked to Fetter, it'd only be wasted breath. I'm beat as it is, more than one way. Did you give Fetter a ring? That's what kicked the whole business off. You yeah. know? You see my face? It doesn't look too bad now, but you should have seen it a week ago. If I had had a gun, I think I'd have shot him. Fetter, you mean, huh? No, he didn't have anything to do with it. I mean Steve Remsen. Who's he? Guy that gave me the ring, the one I gave to Fetter for the money I owed him. I was pretty stupid about it, but that wasn't any reason for me to take the beating. Mm. Where did this Remsen get the ring? Did you get my letter? So I got even with him. Did you know the ring was stolen when you gave it to Fetter? No, Steve just gave it to me. He didn't say anything about where he got it or how much it was worth, nothing. Just before I saw Fetter, I'd had a fight with Steve. Mm -hmm. Got a little loaded. When Fetter asked me for the money, I gave him the ring. Remsen told you it was stolen, did he? Later, after he'd found out what I'd done with it, he got real sore. Said if Fetter tried to pawn the ring, they'd find out about the other stuff. Uh-huh. Said he couldn't go back to the bus station for it. Cops might pick him up. I see. We were up here. He was drinking. Got madder all the time and finally worked me over. Mm-hmm. Fetter got in touch with me after you let him go. Told me what had happened. I didn't let on that I knew about the ring, but that's when I figured how to get even with Steve. I mailed you the letter. You know where Remsen is now? No. He'll probably call today. I haven't seen him since he beat up on me, but he'll call. Trying to make up. I told him we were through. I can get him up here for you. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he lives? Not now. He's moved. Can you give us the address? Sure. But don't you believe me? I wouldn't lie to you, not after what he done to me. Mm -hmm. I want to get even with him, that's all. I don't know why you don't buy it. Well, maybe we will. Yeah? If he shows up. We called the office and another team of men was sent out to check the address Joe Mason had given us for Steve Remsen. We had the name checked through R&I, but without result. Frank went out and moved the car away from the building in case Remsen might show up. We went back to the apartment and waited for him to call. Ten hours went by. She received several calls, but none of them from Remsen. Manuel Pena, one of the detectives checking Remsen's address, called and said that they'd found that he moved away on June 18th. He said they'd make a follow-up investigation. 11.30 p.m. What if he doesn't call me? You said he might, didn't you? I know, but it's never at any particular time. I just said he'd been calling. Maybe he won't. What happens then? We'll wait and see. Remember, hold it so we can hear it now. I know. Hello? Oh, hi. Uh, I don't know if I can make it. Well, I know. I'd like to, but I'll, I'll have to call you. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure, honey. Thanks for calling. Bye. Girlfriend wanted me to go bowling tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. You heard what I told her. Guess it's better not to try to plan anything, huh? Yeah. Ah, that's a front door buzzer. Someone's calling from down below. Door's locked at 10. All right, answer it and hold the receiver so we can hear. You still don't trust me. That's not the point. Oh? It's him. Get him up here. What's that, Steve? Uh-huh. I know, honey. I guess I was wrong, too. Uh-huh. Come on up. Hurry, honey. There. That'll open the front door for him. He'll be right up. Frank, you want to unlock this door? Yeah. You carry a gun? I know he's got one. All set? Yeah. Hiya, doll. Police officers, Remsen, get your hands hey, up. Hey, what's Come going on? Come on, over your head. Hold it right there, Frank. Yeah. What is this, Jill? All right. He's clean. Get your hands behind your back. Come on. You heard them. These are police officers. Honey. Boy, you... All right, hold it right there. Never mind. You and the cops. I should have finished what I started with you. You tried. 
You wouldn't have got your lalit if you'd used your head. We wouldn't be in this mess now. My fault for tying him with a knothead like you. Oh, you... All right, now stop it, both of you. Sure, it's just that you guys never come close if it wasn't for this dumb broad. You tell us. Had it all worked out, things were going just the way I planned. Is that right? Sure, I'd be sitting pretty except for her. Yeah, sure you would. Dumb broad, the biggest mistake she ever made. No, there was one other. What? The first time she talked to you. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 5th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. You know, any king-size cigarette can give you more length, but only Chesterfield gives you premium quality tobacco to go along with it. That's the big difference in king-size cigarettes for my money. Chesterfield has the quality you want. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself. King-size Chesterfield or regular. I think you'll find they're best for you. Steve Lynn Remsen was tried and convicted on one count of burglary in the second degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not more than one year in the county jail or by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one nor more than 15 years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Herb Ellis, Harry Bartell, Georgia Ellis. Script by John Robinson, Earl Schley. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. This is it. l and filters. This is it. Light and mild. Much more flavor. l and filters. Much less nicotine. Light and mild. Remember, it's the filter that counts. And no filter compares with L&M's miracle tip for quality or effectiveness. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine. Buy L&M, king size or regular, both at the same low price. L&M, light and mild. Now to NBC election headquarters in New York. This is Merrill Muller. Here are the latest returns in a surprising election in which voter apathy disappeared during the last two days of the campaign. Millions of voters unexpectedly turned out to vote in freezing weather in the West and rainy mixed weather with snow along the East Coast. As of this time, the Republicans have elected one member to the Senate. She's Margaret Chase Smith in Maine last month. The Democrats have elected 11 senators, all shoe-in, in the South. In other Senate contests, Republicans are leading in five races, the Democrats in seven. In the House, the Republicans have elected 10 members. The Democrats have elected 120, mostly in the South. In other contests, Republicans are leading in 25 House districts. Democrats lead in 10, no net gain. We'll be back on the air at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with a full all-night roundup across the nation. Keep tuned to your NBC station for the later election news. Here's a late bulletin on the Democratic governor contest in New York. The Democratic state chairman says that Averill Harriman is ahead, and the Democrats claim Harriman will win New York by 300,000. This is Merrill Mullery at NBC election headquarters. This is the NBC Radio Network.